Well, good morning again, and uh, I welcome all of our smiling, energetic NRC panelists here, and we gather uh, this morning for the purpose of updating the Commission and all interested stakeholders in the room and tuning in on the progress of Project AIM implementation and related matters. Project AIM has been another journey. Yesterday we were examining the, the year, six year long journey since the uh, accident in Fukushima and the agency's actions, but Project AIM has been a multi-year endeavor where we're seeking to continue to achieve greater organizational efficiency and effectiveness in our regulatory decision making and activities while accomplishing our important safety and security mission. So we look forward to hearing the update today and we'll follow that with some Q&A. Before we begin, Begin with this staff presentation. Do either of my colleagues have any comments? Okay. Well, I will turn it over to Mr. McCree to get started, or Maureen. Maureen's going to start. Okay. Today. Great. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Svinicki, Commissioner Barron, and Commissioner Burns. It's my pleasure to be here today with my colleagues to provide you with an update on the progress of Project AIM implementation and to describe some of the activities the staff has taken toward fulfilling the goals and tasks set forth by Project AIM. First, a little historical context. We started Project AIM in June 2014 with the purpose of enhancing the NRC's ability to plan and execute the agency's mission more efficiently while adapting in a timely and effective manner to a dynamic environment. The first step was to understand our future workload, and to do so, we gathered perspectives from internal and external stakeholders. We identified gaps, obstacles, and areas needing improvements. We evaluated the results of the gap analysis, root causes, and developed strategies to close the gaps from where we were in 2014 to a desired state for the agency. Subsequently, we provided the team's report with recommendations and a roadmap to improve the NRC's effectiveness, efficiency, and agility. The Commission approved 19 tasks focused largely upon right-sizing the agency while retaining the skill sets needed to accomplish our mission, streamlining our agency processes to use resources more efficiently, and improving timeliness in regulatory decision-making and responding quickly to changing conditions. Since your direction on the Project AIM report, and um, we have worked diligently to implement the 19 activities associated with Project AIM, and we have done significant outreach it, internally and externally to keep all stakeholders informed of our progress. In our last briefing to you in July of 2016, we reported on the completion of 10 of the 19 tasks, including our status implementing the 150 approved rebaselining adjustments. Today, I'm glad to report that since then, we've completed the nine additional project aim tasks with the most recent delivery of the staff's assessment of the operating reactor licensing process, business process improvements, and a re-examination of a leadership model for the NRC. We are now in a normal implementation phase of many of the activities stemming out of the project aim tasks. And while we've completed all of the discrete tasks, we continue to seek efficiency within our corporate and mission support functions with follow-up studies in those areas in the spirit of Project AIM. We also continue to infuse the overarching goals of becoming more efficient, effective, and agile regulator into the additional efforts to further streamline our agency processes, improve timeliness in regulatory decision-making, and enhance our strategic workforce development planning. As we implement your direction on fees transformation, we've made significant progress on our proposed changes for 2017, with six of the 14 actions completed and with additional budget transparency included when the 2018 Congressional Budget Justification will be delivered to you. And our successful public meeting on the 2017 proposed fee rule was the earliest ever with our proposed rule being two months earlier than ever published. So next slide, please. Okay. Today's discussion will, will highlight several of the completed tasks as well as various follow-on efforts. We'll start today's presentations with Eric Benner, the Deputy Director, Division of Operating Re Reactor Licensing in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. Eric will discuss operating reactor licensing process improvements. 
then Scott Flanders, Director, Division of Site Safety and Environmental Analysis in the Office of New Reactors, will provide an update on the implementation of centers of expertise. Scott will be followed by Jennifer Golder, Associate Director of Human Resource Training and Development in the Office of the Chief Human Capital Officer. Jennifer will provide an update on the Agency Learning Transformation Initiative. Jennifer will be followed by Rob Lewis, the Assistant for Operations in the Office of EDO. Rob will provide an update on several implementation activities, including a more detailed overview of implementation of rebaselining, and a summary of the recently completed tasks, as well as ongoing initiatives that carry out the tenets of Project AIM. And then finally, we'll hear, uh, we'll end with some closing remarks from Vic. Thank you very much, and I'll now turn the presentation over to Eric Benner. Eric? Thank you, Marie. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Can I get my slides up? Next slide. One of the Congressional Budget Justification, or CBJ, metrics for reactor licensing is to complete at least 95 percent of licensing actions within one year. Timeliness of completing licensing actions is, a, is important because it demonstrates a predictable licensing process and allows licensees to effectively schedule when they need to submit requests. After we re redirected resources in 2013 to support Fukushima response, we only completed 87 percent of our licensing actions within one year in 2014, and thus did not meet the CBJ metric. The number of actions older than one year peaked at 112 in November 2014, at which point we undertook concerted efforts to reduce the number of older actions, including reassignment of staff, use of contractors, and a number of process improvements, which I'll discuss later in my presentation. Next slide, please. As a result of these efforts, we reduced the number of actions greater than one year old to 32 at the end of 2015 and to just 10 at the end of 2016. We'd like to recognize the efforts of our own staff and our partners in NRO, NSER, and OGC for making this happen. Consequently, we met the CBJ metric for 2016 and are maintaining the number of actions greater than one year old low enough that we expect to meet it for 2017 and beyond. Additionally, in 2015, we implemented a goal to increase our performance by 2% per year until the CBJ metric was met. So we anticipated that would have been completed by 2018, but we actually achieved it two years sooner. The chart, get the chart back up, shows this progression graphically. I note that prior to the increase in these older actions, typical numbers uh, hovered in the, uh, the, the high 20s, whereas now we hover around 10. I also note that from 2015 to 2016, we reduced the average time it takes to complete a licensing action by approximately two months. Next slide, please. So going back to what we did to improve our performance, in November 2014, we began holding executive team workload management meetings once a month and leadership team workload management meetings twice a month. In these meetings, we focused on progress of licensing performance restoration activities, identification and resolution of obstacles, and lessons learned from recent complex and challenging reviews. In January 2015, we issued additional guidance to reinforce the expectations in existing procedures and emphasize several key items, including ensuring that our workload management system dates reflected realistic schedules to support workload forecasting, drafting safety evaluations early in the process with information needs correlating to requests for additional information, or RAIs, to ensure that the information we were requesting was necessary to make a regulatory determination, ensuring greater division management focus on RAIs, particularly second round RAIs, and lastly, initiating early division management engagement on differing views or potential denials of licensing actions. Next slide, please. In April 2016, we issued revised guidance based on lessons learned to improve efficiency of the licensing process regarding considering other tools such as audits or public meetings in lieu of second round RAIs when those tools could support more efficient and timely resolution of outstanding technical issues. 
streamlined processing of grouped or particularly complex submittals, enhancing communications to ensure timely identification of issues that could warrant non-acceptance, and leveraging the license amendment denial process to hold licensees accountable in providing timely and complete responses to RAIs. We started several initiatives specifically targeting areas where improvements could enhance the licensing process. Specifically, the initiatives were to one, improve acceptance reviews and licensing procedures, resulting in us issuing revised procedures in January of this year, which adopted and expanded on the revised guidance I just mentioned. Two, improve regulatory decision making. And three, evaluate information needs for conducting licensing reviews. I'll discuss items two and three on the next slide. In October 2016, we deployed a new workload management platform called Replacement RPS, which offers more flexibility and will aid in processing and managing licensing activities. We also interacted with industry with the goal of improving licensing performance and consistency. Specifically, we issued Regulatory Issue Summary 2015-16, seeking input from reactor licensees regarding licensing actions predicted to be submitted over the next two years. Industry provided feedback that they can't reliably predict licensing workload beyond a year, so we do not intend to issue another risk. However, we now have our project managers obtain updates through their routine interactions with licensees and cre have created a database of this information which we can use to plan resources for critical skill areas and for prioritizing licensing activities. We also sent a letter to all operating power reactor licensees in August 2016 to communicate that licensing performance had returned to normal and what they should expect from their project managers, such as encouragement to have pre-application meetings on complex or first-of-a-kind reviews. Next slide, please. As I mentioned in the last slide, we have two additional initiatives ongoing in this area. The first is to improve regulatory decision making, which has resulted in development of a new timely evaluation and resolution process, or TERP, which was available for a draft use until the end of last year, and which we're currently finalizing. The second is to evaluate what information is necessary to demonstrate reasonable assurance in licensing reviews which has resulted in development of concept of using structured, multi-level guidance for large routine reviews. We're piloting this concept this year before expanding its use. We are also preparing to manage increased numbers of risk-informed license amendment requests, such as submittals under 10 CFR 5069, by working with industry on amendment templates, identifying dedicated review teams, and conducting periodic management status meetings. We also plan to reassess on an ongoing basis the need for more diagnostic looks into the licensing process and individual licensing actions based on actual performance. As an example, we are currently conducting an audit of recent RAIs to validate whether they are following our revised guidance. Next slide, please. To support sustained high licensing performance, we established the following additional internal metrics for 2017. One, greater than or equal to 90% of actions completed within 125% of hours forecasted. Two, greater than or equal to 90% of actions completed within the schedule forecasted plus one month. And three, greater than or equal to 95% of acceptance reviews completed on time. The purpose of the first metric, resource estimate adherence, is to ensure that licensing actions are completed in accordance with the resource estimates that we develop at the beginning of our review and share with the licensee. Regarding the second metric, schedule adherence, the CBJ timeliness metric reflects an overall timeliness goal for completion of licensing actions, but does not adequately account for the many licensing actions that licensees request on an expedited schedule. These licensing actions are typically of higher priority to the applicant because they are indicative of situations that may impede a plant startup or necessitate a plant shutdown if not resolved. We developed this metric to better assess our performance on these higher priority licensing actions and demonstrate predictability to licensees requesting such expedited schedules. Regarding the third metric, acceptance review schedule adherence, acceptance reviews are performed to ensure that an application is of acceptable quality before we begin our detailed technical review. 
For the 2017 CBJ metric, we determined that the review duration considered should start at the time we determine that an application is acceptable to more accurately capture our performance of our detailed technical review. However, we identified that we are taking longer on acceptance reviews than expected, and if this continued, it could be perceived as we are allowing ourselves more time to review licensing actions. To address this possible perception, we identified the need to more closely monitor our performance in this area and develop this performance metric. Next slide, please. Task number 19 in the Project AIM Integrated Implementation Plan implemented Recommendation 3-2 in SECI 15-0015. This recommendation was to, quote, improve licensing by conducting a business process improvement, or BPI, of the operating reactor licensing process and make associated improvements to enhance the predictability, timeliness, and efficiency of the reviews while ensuring and measuring the effectiveness and quality of the reviews, close quote. We have concluded that the desired outcomes of the BPI have been achieved without the need for the additional time and cost of a formal BPI. In reaching this conclusion, we considered many of the things discussed today, including our actions that restored licensing review performance within standards established in the CBJ, as well as our implemented, ongoing, and planned licensing process improvements, including enhanced performance monitoring and management oversight. We documented this basis in COMSECI 17-0004 issued last month, which is now before you for review. We hope that this presentation and our answering any of your questions today will help support your evaluation of our recommendation. Thank you. That concludes my presentation, and now I'll turn it over to Scott. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. Can I have the next slide, please? My presentation this morning will discuss five main items. I will provide a brief review of the project aim recommendations leading to the formation of additional centers of expertise, or COEs, an overview of the subsequent guidance developed to identify, evaluate, and implement additional COEs a status of COE implementation, and a brief discussion of the near-term and longer-term benefits from implement, implementing the COEs, as well as the COE periodic assessment. Kevin, next slide, please. The project game report recommended that the staff explore greater reliances on, COE, on COEs with the expected outcome of improved workload distribution, enhanced collaboration, improved knowledge transfer, and enhanced agility. The report recommended that additional or expanded COEs be evaluated in 11 areas. The Commission approved the recommendations and directed the staff to provide an evaluation that, one, determine which of the additional COEs to create, where they should be housed, and the efficiencies that would be gained. Two, to discuss how the centers would avoid stove piping and minimize organizational complexity and confusion. And three, to implement the lessons learned from existing COEs, office mergers, and the TABS report. In response, we formed a multi-office working group to conduct the evaluation directed by the Commission. From this effort, we recommended formation of three limited scope COEs in the areas of allegations, external hazards, and technical specifications, as well as one agency-wide COE rulemaking. We concluded that these specific actions would provide benefits similar to those gained from existing COEs and also increase readiness for the potential merger of NRR and NRO. Finally, we concluded that stovepiping and organizational complexity and confusion might be avoided through the development of a standardized process for the creation of a COE and guidance on ground rules for COEs regarding prioritization, reporting, decision making, and communication. The Commission approved the recommendation to pursue the COEs in the four specific areas, provided that we complete a number of tasks, including creating agency-wide guidance on identifying, evaluating, and implementing COEs. Can I have the next slide, please? We completed and issued EDO Procedure 940 guidance for identifying, evaluating, and implementing a center of expertise on April 28, 2016. We use this procedure to guide the formation of the COEs approved by the Commission. The procedure describes the process to identify and evaluate the benefits, risk, and costs of possible COEs and the basic steps to implement a new COE. 
Stovepiping and organization complexity and confusion are specific issues that are considered in the benefits, risk, and cost evaluation. The procedure also provides a change process to define and document necessary activities that should be managed during the transition to ensure effective, long-term, and sustainable results. The procedure details the type of documentation required to create centers of expertise. The details of the required documents are intended to communicate the business case for the COE, how the COE will operate, including the mission, vision, and roles and responsibilities, and how the COE will be implemented and communicated to assure organizational impacts are minimized. Finally, the procedure details the establishment of a periodic assessment process which, which results in the development of recommendations and corrective actions, as well as methods to track actions to ensure proper follow-up and completion. Okay, the next slide, please. To date, we have successfully implemented three limited scope COEs in the areas of allegations, external hazards, and technical specifications involving a total of 13 staff. For each of these COEs, we've managed the transition to ensure that implementation did not adversely affect ongoing and other work activities, ongoing reviews and other work activities. The rulemaking COE, which will affect approximately 31 staff, is expected to be stood up in October, on October 1st, 2017. Significant progress has been made toward implementation of the rulemaking COE. We formed an implementation team in July of 2016 that developed an outline of the goals of the rulemaking COE. The implementation team has completed a number of additional activities, such as holding a number of alignment meetings with impacted and partner offices, drafting the COE creation documents required by the EDO procedure, developing a change management plan using the NRC change management framework launched in the fall of 2016, and actively engaging affected staff to collect and share information. They've held monthly employee meetings and established a SharePoint site to share information and provide opportunities to collaborate on documents. Can I have the next slide, please? In proposing the four COEs to the Commission, we stated that the COEs would provide an opportunity to improve the agency's ability to respond to changing workload without an increase in resources, increased readiness of the NRR and NRO merger, and enhance effective knowledge management and agency-wide standardization. The newly created COEs are still young, and while the benefits of implementing them have not been fully realized, we have seen some benefits. <clears throat> Specifically, near-term near example, uh, near-term benefits include, for the allegation COE, the integration of the NMSS and office-wide, uh, excuse me, and the Office of International Programs Coordinator uh, into the headquarters office allegation team has allowed for timely and efficient coordination of NMSS and Office of International Programs allegations and makes it more efficient in terms of the implementation and oversight functions. For external hazards, bringing all the meteorologists and NRR and NRO together has enhanced our capacity to review multiple operating reactor licensing amendments. For some time, only one staff member was trained to do these reviews. Now we have several, which increases our agility, reduces our risk of review delays, and allows for standardization between reviews. Likewise, the NRR reviewer is being trained on new reactor reviews, which broadens the reviewer's abilities and facilitates effective knowledge management. Bringing the external hazard technical experts together has enhanced knowledge sharing as well. An example that comes to mind actually predates the formal external hazard COE implementation date. In, the, in 2014, NRR and NRO agreed to detail to NRO the sole NRR hydrologist who at the time was the lead reviewer for a Watts Bar 1 license amendment request. The NRR reviewer was teamed with an NRO staff reviewer with complementary skills, which avoided the time and resources needed to contract for additional expertise. The collaboration and knowledge sharing between the reviewers and other hydrologists in the branch resulted in the staff completing the Watts Bar 1 license amendment request on an accelerated schedule. The same team was then assigned to review the near-term task force recommendation 2.1 flooding reevaluations for the three TVA sites, leading to additional review efficiencies. Now, with the formation of the COE, the same team of reviewers is assigned to review the Clinch River early site permit. In the longer term, we anticipate more benefits from the COEs. With the rulemaking COE, we expect to gain increased agency-wide standardization of rulemaking activities. Also, 
more staff, as more staff becomes cross-trained, we expect to further increase our organizational capacity. Next slide. In working to realize the benefits from the COE, we are mindful of the importance of addressing challenges and costs that could reduce or offset any benefits. As directed by the Commission, each COE will perform periodic assessments to evaluate its performance. The first self-assessments self will be completed within one year of the COE's implementation. The finding from these assessments and reports will result in the development of recommendations and corrective actions that are translated into tangible actions to improve the COE's performance. That concludes my remarks, and now I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Thanks, Scott. Good morning, Chairman Svinicki, Commissioner Barron, Commissioner Burns. It's my pleasure to present you an update on the NRC's Learning Transformation Initiative, as well as the competency modeling effort. Next slide. In 2015, Ochico briefed the Commission on an initiative to look at ways to improve learning in the agency. We discussed why we train, how transforming learning can lead to efficiencies, including greater flexibility, by making learning content available anytime from anywhere, potential reductions in qualification times, and reductions in costs related to travel for training. Additionally, we proposed improvements in learning effectiveness by providing a variety of blended learning solutions, tools, and a platform to conduct a more collaborative learning approach. In 2016, we briefed the Commission on how the Learning Transformation Initiative fit into developing the workforce. The goal is to be able to modify or create new development activities as we identify specific development needs to close skill gaps, which will improve performance on the job. We also spoke of the need to adapt our learning environment to change with reductions in budget support and to leverage techno technological solutions where efficiency improvements could be gained. Additionally, we developed a plan to map agency positions to competencies by developing models that outline the fundamental framework for how we learn to do the work we perform. We conducted a pilot and the results suggested the importance of soft skills, such as oral and written communications, conflict management, and analysis and critical thinking, regardless of the position. Among the models created, we identified consistencies of competency among technical positions. This could indicate that many of the technical positions are similar, but with some specialty skill or knowledge. If this continues to prove true as more models are developed, this could help streamline qualification programs and enable staff to move and qualify for positions more quickly. Throughout 2016, we continue to seek opportunities to expand the transformation of learning and have begun to modernize more courses. Both efforts show promise of efficiency improvements and cost reductions while continuing to ensure the NRC has a highly skilled and motivated workforce. I now expand on our current status of transforming learning and our development of a business case for competency modeling activities. Next slide, please. We completed a number of modernization activities last year while also continuing to conduct and deliver a wide range of our traditional technical training. Highlights include the completion of the series distance learning pilot, upgrades to the collaborative learning environment, expanding the fundamental health physics online program, and beginning the movement of some of our technology-related courses to a more blended approach. Next slide, please. The distance learning pilot involved taking what has traditionally been a face-to-face -face course and allowed a group of students to attend the same training remotely. We collaborated with several offices, including NRR Research and NRO, to develop a pilot where we conducted part of the seven-week Westinghouse Technology Series remotely. This began in late July and concluded in September and consists of a three-week systems course, a two-week advanced technology course, and a two-week on-site simulator course. From the multiple offices, 14 students participated in the pilot. There were also eight in-class students at the TTC. All distance learners participated in the three-week systems course, and six distance learners attended the two-week advanced technology course. All attendees were in person for the two-week simulator course at the Technical Training Center. The distance portions were broadcast live from the classroom with the online students attending either from their office or home using the GoTo training application. The exam pass rate was consistent with other in-class training. Travel savings for the first two parts equated to approximately $109,000. 
We consider the pilot a success in that we provided an opportunity for students to attend the series who otherwise would have been delayed in taking it or would not have been able to attend. We also provide prove we can successfully administer the course in a distance learning approach with similar results as in class courses. There were a few challenges, including the technology used and the difficulty presenting the materials online and in classroom at the same time resulted in us not being as efficient as we believe we could have been. Post debriefs were held with the instructors and producers and interviews were held with students to obtain feedback on what went well and what improvements could be made. As a whole, the comments were positive and the technology performed well. Areas for improvement included enhancing instructor to student and student to instructor communications. We'll continue to find opportunities to, to test this again in the future. And we do appreciate the Office of Chief Information Officer, NRR, NRO research, and research for supporting and participating in the pilot. Next slide, please. We continue to have success with the fundamental of health physics course, of which a large portion of the students are agreement state employees. We merged an additional week of in-class training into the online course. And if we look at the overall picture, the two courses were originally three weeks of in-person training, equating to 120 hours. And the course now requires a redu reduced time commitment. It includes approximately 50 hours of self-paced effort spread over nine weeks and a five-day in-person lab at the TTC. We have been able to reduce the amount to 90 hours, which, and while that is only a reduction of 30 hours of training, it does increase flexibility in that it is self-paced. There's also an associated travel savings since employees only have to travel to the TTC for the five-day in-person lab, and they don't have to be away from their jobs for long periods of time. Due to the success, we're expanding this approach to additional health physics courses and other technology-related topics. Our focus has extended beyond technology-related courses as well. For example, the RASCAL Radiological Assessment System for Consequence Analysis software course has been moved online. It was two days and now is a two-hour two interactive software tutorial. And as you can tell, we've been very busy in 2016. Next slide, please. Moving forward this year, we're expanding the number of courses that we're reviewing and considering for transformation. We're supporting professional development online courses that have traditionally been in person, in person, and given time limitations, I'm only gonna talk about a few. We expect power plant engineering to be online in mid-2017. This was originally a three-week introductory course on power plant theory. And a few years ago, it was reduced to two weeks. Over the last year, we've updated the content and we're in the final stages of building the online course. It will have a similar look and feel as the online health physics course and will provide test out capability. Once online, staff will be able to utilize this course whenever they need it for qualification or a knowledge asset. We continue to expand the health physics courses online. The introductory health physics course is one week long and part of what the agreement states use to prepare potential inspectors for the qualification programs. It's a basic course and is widely attended. We typically teach this three to four times a year. The conversion will provide savings and efficiencies in travel and time spent by agreement state and their employees. And it should be online by mid-2017. Next slide, please. Going to now shift to competency modeling. And as discussed in the June EEO Commission, um, Human Capital Commission meeting, competency models can provide a variety of strategic capabilities for the agency. It can support training and development, recruitment, performance management, and workforce planning. Last year, we completed a pilot project laying the framework for a broader effort to reaffirm the competencies of critical positions in the agency. Next slide, please. As mentioned in the June Human Capital Commission briefing, as part of the pilot project, we built models for reliability and risk analysts and health physics decommissioning inspectors, and we purchased models in the area of, of cybersecurity and cloud computing. Employees in these roles and their supervisors have been using the software to conduct skill gap assessments and create IDPs to close gaps. In NRR, one supervisor used the model to help guide the development activities of, employ of an employee who was on rotation to his branch. And in research, a supervisor is using the data from the model to assist in reassigning the workload across the branch of an employee who retired and has not been replaced. 
We're continuing to seek feedback from users so we can continue to refine the skill, the, the tool. While the model and tool show promise, it does require time and resources to build and update the training curricula. We've extended the pilot to develop a business case to help quantify the benefits these changes can deliver. The project will entail building models for several more roles, including resident inspectors in advanced reactor positions, expanding the number of users in the tool, gathering time and cost data for our, our traditional qualification programs, and calculating time and cost to complete these new competency-based development programs. We believe the business case will demonstrate that the models will identify what should be trained, eliminating the need for some of the content currently required by existing qualification programs, resulting in increased effectiveness. And the content that's required will be restructured and developed using, using learning transformation principles, resulting in increased efficiency. I do appreciate the support we've received from managers and staff across the agency, including um, people in NRR, NRO, NMSS, research, CIO, and the regions. And you can tell we've been busy, and we look forward to more improvements, and I'll turn it over to Rob. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here this morning to summarize and share what I believe is a great set of work by many people across NRC towards fulfilling the goals and strategies set forth in the Project AIM initiative. In addition to the tasks that our previous presenters have mentioned, there's substantial progress to report since the last Project AIM Commission briefing on, October, on July 21st, 2016. The Project AIM team and, and myself in OEDO have been coordinating and implementing the NRC's wide-ranging Project AIM efforts. Many of our Project AIM activities, status updates, and project documents are accessible from the NRC's public website. Specifically, there's a link in, to Project AIM's webpage in the Spotlight section. Slide 28, please. As you know, Project AIM is the NRC's strategic initiative to enhance our ability to plan and execute our mission while adapting in a timely and effective manner to a dynamic regulatory environment. In June 2015, the Commission approved 19 Project AIM recommendations from SECI 15-0015 that addressed NRC's need to improve efficiency and agility as well as right size while retaining employees with the appropriate skills to accomplish our mission and streamline our processes. Project AIM has recently achieved a significant milestone in that we have now completed the major deliverables for each of the 19 Project AIM tasks. Task 18 on development of an explicit leadership model for NRC was delivered to the Commission on February 6, and Vic will speak to that in a few moments. Task 19, on operating reactor licensing process efficiencies was delivered for commission consideration on January 25th, 2017, as discussed by Eric. We are not done. Sustained effort, planning, and leadership remain essential for future success. While we recognize the success to date of Project AIM, we also recognize we must continue to identify and further enhance the agency's effectiveness and efficiency. Our long-standing principles of good regulation, specifically the principle of efficiency, <coughs> compel us to adopt the alternative that minimizes the use of resources when choosing among several effective regulatory alternatives. We'll continue to embrace efficiency beyond the 19 Project AIM tasks by encouraging innovation and new initiatives to improve the way we work. Slide 29, please. One of the centerpieces of Project AIM was task five of the 19, to prioritize all the agency's work and implement a one-time rebaselining to identify work that could be shed, deferred, or performed with fewer resources. In April 2016, the Commission approved 150 rebaselining recommendations, most of which to be implemented within six months, a few of which to be implemented within 12 or 18 months. The rebaselining effort represents reductions of about $48 million, including 185 full-time equivalent staff for FTE for NRC. As of today, we've implemented 138 rebaselining re recommendations, saving $41 million. 
In addition, we are making progress evaluating and implementing the longer-term efficiencies identified in SECI 16-0035, additional rebaselining projects, products. We've implemented six of the 16 longer-term efficiencies identified in that paper. For example, on December 2nd, we issued a major update to Management Directive 3.57, which is the agency's main procedure on correspondence management. That update includes many efficiencies that will help our administrative staff. We'll continue to work on implementation of the remaining rebaselining approved recommendations and the longer-term efficiencies going forward. Slide 30, please. I'd like to end by sharing some initiatives and opportunities that supplement or complement the project aim tasks and, and their outcomes. These initiatives serve as an indicator that the fundamental tenets of project aim are being embraced by NRC employees across the agency. On this slide, I have four examples, but there are others. First, on September 15, 2016, Vic issued a change management strategy to improve the agency effectiveness, efficiency, and agility which was communicated to all staff and presented at multiple opportunities, such as division and office all hands meetings. This strategy lays out specific actions and communicates expectations that are important to enable the people side of the project aim changes to complement the project management side that, that the team and I have been managing. The three-tiered strategy includes activities to encourage employee growth and development, enable innovation, and foster a work environment where people are engaged and equipped to embrace change. This strategy is now being employed to guide change at all levels of the agency, from business lines down to individual branches. Second, in the spirit of continuous improvement through innovation, one of the projects of the senior executive class, senior executive service candidate development program class of 2017 focused on developing an agency level idea greenhouse program, building upon innovation programs already established in some of our regional offices. Notably, this program is designed to be staff driven, scalable and transparent. Agency level adoption of the idea greenhouse will help foster cross office sharing of best practices. Third, on December 29, 2016, a task force provided a report to the EDO with recommendations to standardize and centralize support staff functions in NRC headquarters and in the regional offices. This effort built upon the project aim task 14, which reviewed and, reviewed and gave recommendations to consolidate regional corporate support functions. The task force, contains se the task force report contains several efficiencies effectiveness and efficiency recommendations, easy for me to say, across functional areas of financial management, administrative services, and human resources. Finally, as Maureen mentioned, when Project AIM started, we cast a wide net, both internally and externally, to collect efficiency ideas. One idea that ultimately didn't make the final list of 19 tasks was to increase NRC's sharing of investigation information electronically. Uh, currently, longstanding practices to share such investigation information in hard copy due to its sensitivity. Recently, a task force was formed with the goal of putting in place secure electronic sharing procedures between the Office of Investigations, the Office of Enforcement, the Office of the General Counsel, the Office of the Chief Information Officer, and the Regions. Expected efficiencies including de include decreasing printing and mailing costs and enhanced ability to search and manipulate large volumes of information during our investigation work. These examples show how project aim activities have encouraged a culture of seeking efficiencies throughout NRC. I'll now turn the presentation over to Vic. Thank you, Rob. Uh, good morning, Chairman, uh, Commissioners Barron, Commissioner Burns, and thanks again for your time. Uh, as you've heard, we're sustaining the momentum um, brought by Project AIM since its inception almost three years ago. We continue to demonstrate our ability to coordinate and collaborate across organizations to achieve and deliver the many milestones of this project. Uh, this is a clear reflection of the commitment of our people 
to work to achieve a common goal in support of our important safety and security mission. I'm proud of our progress thus far, and this is due in no small way to the dedication shown in accomplishing these tasks, in some cases delivering results sooner than anticipated. We recognize many project aim activities also generated some level of anxiety within the staff as we worked and continue to work to shed lower priority work, to streamline and standardize our processes, to centralize functions towards reducing resources and costs. We've seen this reflected in feedback, uh, survey results, and from our outreach activities. And we incorporated this feedback in our change management process as well as our ongoing efforts to foster a climate of trust within the NRC by first communicating more clearly and regularly, uh, secondly clarifying our roles and responsibilities in the decision making process, thirdly promoting a common understanding of terms such as collaboration, consensus, agility and empowerment, fourthly supporting staff driven efforts in the offices and regions to promote employee engagement, innovation and open dialogue, and fifthly, encouraging the use of change management tools. We also recognize the potential benefits of implementing an explicit NRC leadership model to further enhance employee engagement. As indicated in the recent ComSec E17006, 0006 rather, which again was recently provided to you for consideration, we believe that such a model would focus on important organizational characteristics such as empowerment and shared leadership innovation and risk tolerance, uh, partic participative decision making, uh, diversity in thought, uh, receptivity to new ideas and thinking, and collaboration and teamwork. I see an explicit leadership model uh, as a key enabler that will help us to instill the behaviors throughout the NRC that will allow us to more readily embrace change. Our organizational values and principles will remain unchanged. They've been effective pillars for NRC's organizational culture and performance for over 20 years, and they remain so. However, through the reexamination that you afforded us through the staff requirements memo on Project AIM, we've identified cultural gaps between those pillars that we have an opportunity to fill and to interconnect to ensure that the benefits of Project AIM are sustained. We believe an explicit leadership model Focused on the areas I just described will address those gaps and provide a means to institutionalize be the behaviors that will further drive efficiency, effectiveness, and agility into the NRC culture. As you know, one of the objectives of Project AIM is having the right people with the right skills and the right job at the right time. We delivered a strategic workforce plan to the Commission last year, and in it, we acknowledged the need to update our approach to strategic workforce planning as circumstances warrant. As you know, I recently directed the establishment of a working group to enhance strategic workforce planning. The objective of the working group is to provide a clear, comprehensive, consistent, coherent approach to integrating the agency's workload, projection, skills identification, human capital management, individual development, and workforce management activities. The working group is actively carrying out its charge and has thus far evaluated strategic workforce planning practices across the agency, developed an early draft enhanced strategic workforce planning process, and scheduled outreach efforts with external stakeholders to identify best practices. They're on track to uh, submit and implement submit an implementation plan to me late in April. I'm optimistic that the working group will recommend enhancements to our strategic workforce planning process that will improve our capacity and agility to meet emerging needs and workforce fluctuations to accomplish the agency's mission. I want to emphasize that we're not, we're not moving forward in a vacuum. Uh, we recognize that a best practice in high performance organizations is continuous learning. So to ensure uh, ongoing future activities are carried out, we will inform those activities with the results of an assessment of the tasks and efforts that have been completed to date. We'll start by assessing the 19 project tasks to identify successes and areas for improvement. This is just the first of such assessments to be performed. We will periodically assess the efficacy of the project aim related efforts as they are implemented. Slide 33, please. Looking forward, 
Project AIM tasks are truly just the beginning of our transformation to become a more effective, efficient, and agile regulator. Although we've now delivered on the 19 specific Project AIM tasks and our positioning for official closure of the project, the cultural changes embodied in this effort will endure. And from my perspective, that is the key success. We will continue to identify and pursue opportunities to further enhance efficiency beyond those specifically directed by the Commission. And we're proud of what we've done and have underway. I hope we've conveyed the extent uh, to which we do embrace change and agility while keeping our focus on our important safety and security mission. I'd like to conclude by thanking the numerous members of the Project AIM uh, task force, uh, both the members of the staff uh, and management throughout the agency, some of whom are here today, uh, for their efforts uh, and continued support of Project AIM and the various ongoing efforts uh, that stem from this project. Uh, that completes our presentation, and we're prepared for your questions and comments. Thank you all for the presentations. We begin our Q&A today with Commissioner Barron. Please proceed. Thanks. Um, well, thank you for your presentations and uh, all of your efforts. I want to start with some questions about how we're coping with the significant FTE reductions that have resulted from Project AIM and what effect those reductions are having on the agency's capabilities. NRC has reduced its total FTEs by more than 11% in just two years, bringing us to around our 2007 FTE level. Although Project AIM has been valuable, these steep reductions do create some challenges. For the agency's long-term health, we need a stable pipeline of new talent. And we need to keep the talent we already have in the midst of all these changes. With more people leaving the agency, we need to make sure that we're capturing all of that knowledge. Every organization has to manage these challenges, but it's harder during a period of downsizing. Uh, with that backdrop, I want to ask about our ability to handle new, unexpected work. Do we have and are we going to be able to maintain a surge capacity for when significant, unexpected work comes along, like, say, the potential construction of the Bellefonte reactors? Well, Commissioner, that's a great question. I, I think I'll, I'll start and perhaps let my uh, uh, colleagues um, comment as well. I think that's an uh, important question, and it's one uh, that I ask uh, myself ru routinely. Uh, I would offer, first of all, that, as you know, the focus of, of, re of the rebaselining component of Project AIM was to identify lower priority work that we could shed, uh, and, and we've done so, and, and we're doing so, and that, uh, in many, some cases, has involved uh, a reduction in the associated FTE. Uh, and we're complementing that or enabling that through uh, the uh, constrained hiring that we've had in place uh, over the last few years. Um, I do recognize that we cannot continue to do that indefinitely, uh, that there will, uh, we will, we need to identify a floor uh, at which we can sustain our capacity to carry out our, our safety and security mission. Um, and that's something, again, that the senior leadership team is aware of, and we plan to have uh, more detailed discussions at our strategic leadership meeting in May uh, to better understand where that floor is in terms of the work that we have on board now and that that we anticipate uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, I, that, and to enable us to, the, one of the reasons that I, the um, update to our approach to strategic workforce planning was also timely is because it also uh, has a role in, uh, in helping us to determine what that, what that floor uh, what that floor is. Uh, as to uh, anticipated work that uh, um, uh, may require skills that either we don't have or don't have in sufficient uh, uh, numbers, that's an area that we're looking at, uh, at currently because we are um, uh, considering uh, the impact of, of some uh, additional work, whether it's in advanced reactors or, or perhaps in, um, in, the, in, um, in the area of materials where new fuels or new fuel design may uh, require a capacity that we don't have on board. So we're identifying steps now that we can take to mitigate those, uh, those areas. I, I appreciate that you're doing that and you kind of predicted the, the next question I had, which is about how do we um, ensure that core capabilities are maintained uh, in the staff. And you, you mentioned one of the examples I had in mind, which is, you know, we're, we're seeing growing interest in advanced technology fuel. We're hearing about growing interest in submittals on 5069. And it raises the question for me about, um, you know, how do we make sure we retain the technical and regulatory expertise 
uh, to handle complex areas of work like that. Um, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense to match our workload um, to, to our staffing. Uh, but when you have an exact match, what room does that leave you for a surge capability? And if the work we have today or we anticipate for tomorrow um, doesn't include certain capabilities that we're going to need a year or two from now, how do we handle that? And it sounds like you're focused on those, those issues, the kind of challenges of, of the downsizing. Well, again, we, we are focused on it. Um, I'd like to say that we have all the answers today for all the areas that we anticipate, but, uh, but we, we're, we're working on it. Um, I, I do recognize that we do have uh, capacity beyond the NRC to uh, tap into other resources, whether they're uh, via contract or, or from the labs. We, we do have that capacity in, uh, to, uh, to seek additional support. Uh, but again, as part of our strategic workforce planning efforts, we're, one of the assumptions is that we retain uh, the capability uh, and nourish that capability in-house for, for those critical skills that we need within the NRC. Uh, so that's our, that's our near-term focus, is to make sure that we have uh, and retain that capability uh, in-house. Okay. Um, let me ask one more kind of big picture question on, uh, on FTE reductions, and that's, you know, when I see the lists that come out weekly of NRC employees who are leaving the agency for one reason or another. I see a lot of really talented individuals on that list who I think it's a real shame we're losing for whatever reason. How, how do we retain our next generation of, of agency leaders um, who may be concerned that they won't have the same opportunities they may have had for advancement a few years ago? Um, how, how are we addressing that so that um, we don't lose our kind of rising stars um, and, our, and our talent that we have today? So I think that's a multi-part answer, uh, part of which I spoke to in, in my remarks, and that is, one, creating an environment where they can see themselves growing in within the NRC. Uh, this isn't the first time in, in our history where we've gone through periods where we've had, uh, uh, we've been reducing staff and, and there's been a reduction in opportunities, if you would, um, in terms of promotion opportunities. Uh, but there have always been, and we're making sure that even now we're creating opportunities for people to grow and, and develop. Um, because at some point, we, I will anticipate, again, that there are more opportunities for uh, promotion opportunities. But meanwhile, we have to create an environment where uh, people can see themselves in and see themselves uh, grow and, uh, and, and be with NRC for, for a long time. Let me uh, ask about a couple of the papers that are before the commission. One um, that Eric talked about was the, um, or is the operating reactor licensing business process improvement paper. That's a lot of adjectives for one paper, but um, that's what it's about. And, um, you know, let me just start by saying I think the staff deserves a lot of credit um, for working through the licensing backlog uh, that had built up in 2013 and 2014. Uh, you know, as Eric talked about, uh, over really about a two-year period, the number of licensing actions pending for more than a year went from 112 to just 10. That's a pretty significant reduction. Um, Eric, can you give us a flavor for the few actions that are, are taking longer than a year to resolve? What kind of actions are they? How complex are they? Are these the kinds of licensing actions we would actually expect would take longer than a year to resolve? Well, I'll give sort of a, a multi-part answer because they all, um, we assess complexity when an, an application first comes in and we try to create a schedule and apply the right resources to it from the, the front end. And, and actually certain classes of, of applications such as extended power up rates are excluded from the one year metric because they're on a different schedule. So it's not just complexity. What I would call it is, is something I would say is emerging complexity. We get into a review, and we typically do a schedule for nine to 10 months nominally. And that schedule is predicated on one round of RAIs, because we almost always have one round of RAIs. But if we get into the review and you know, either the responses to the first round of RAIs aren't adequate, or we find that this was more complex than we had originally anticipated, 
then in all likelihood there's going to be supplemental information needed from the licensee or a second round of RAIs. And almost by definition, if you start with a nine to 10 month review and you add another cycle of interaction with the licensee, at that point you're pretty much pressing up against the 12 month metric. So, you know, at that point we still try to achieve 12 months, but some of those go over. So I think the good thing about where we're at now is when you've got 112 of these things, you're just, you know, trying to throw resources at it and get these things down. Now that we only have, most months we only have 10 things that are over 12 months, we look at those individually and, and, and really are able to keep management focused to say, do we need any more? Do we need to elevate this? Do we need to look at other, other activities? We actually, um, about three months ago, said, hey, we're going to look at all the ones that are over 12 months and look for any thins or consistencies. And we, and we really found there, there were none when you get down to that low of a level. OK. And the, the thrust of the staff's paper is that um, you know, to get the backlog down, a lot of process improvements were made as part of that. And the staff's recommendation is, well, we don't need a formal business process improvement effort at this point because we effectively accomplished that already. Is, are there any you know, significant efficiencies you think we would get from having a formal business process improvement initiative or, or I, not really? I'll start with the short answer, no. Okay. Um, obviously, I'll expand. The, the business process improvement would obviously be very structured in a detailed look. And, and I would say there's two, two parts of how it could look at efficiencies in the process. First is the pure process efficiencies. You know, do you have unnecessary steps? Are you doing the steps in the most efficient manner? We feel like we've really squeezed down on that part to, to say this, this process is lean and mean. For example, you know, we've moved a lot more to electronic communications. It used to be we did everything by letter. Now with the ability to capture emails and atoms, like when we transmit RAIs, that is done via email and, and we automatically capture that in, in atoms. So we're, we're really trying to get rid of any work that we would perceive as not value added. The other piece is what, what true technical work is necessary to make a regulatory decision. And that's where we're not done yet. And I talked about our, our um, you know, technical adequacy initiative. And that's where we are still looking hard at, you know, particularly for, you know, repeated large reviews. And I'm going to use the 5069 example in, in a moment, that if we can really get down to what is truly the minimum amount of review necessary to, to approve uh, an application like that, that's where we're going to have resource savings moving forward. So I, I don't, you know, we already are working on that issue, so I don't think a BPI would, would add much effort, would add much efficiency. So going back to the example of um, 10 CFR 5069, one of the things we've seen in the past is, you know, we'll get a new big thing and we'll start reviewing it and we'll kind of learn on the fly. So what are we doing now? Now we know these are going to be coming in, right? We have the new regulation in place. Industry has said there's going to be many of these coming in. So we're working with industry to say, okay, let's have a template so we have, you know, consistent applications come in. Let's have the dialogue beforehand so we know what sort of information should be included in that application so we get a high quality application. Let's plan to have, you know, the, the, you know, the right knowledgeable people review the first wave of those so that they, you know, really can hit those hard. Let's capture their lessons learned in this, you know, detailed guidance so that as we get more and more of these in, new reviewers assigned to those reviews aren't having to learn on the fly. They now have a roadmap of how do you conduct this review in an efficient and effective manner. So that's, that's what we see as the, you know, the, the future efficiencies to be gained in this process. Okay, thanks. I was hoping to have a chance to talk about the leadership model, but we see maybe that comes up in the rest of the conversation. Thanks, Vic. Thank you. Commissioner Burns? Thanks. Thanks. I may touch on it if I uh, get a chance to the end. Um, I do want to express my appreciation to the staff for the work that has been done 
and a project aim. I am a little bit concerned about Vic's use of the words official closure. And I'll say that because I think what we have seen and in extraordinary efforts, and I think very important efforts as we move forward, is in effect building the house, laying the foundation, putting in place the uh, processes and frameworks. But I think what we still have out there is the success of application and the assessment of the application of those frameworks and those structures. And, and for example, I will take the strategic workforce plan. We're actually in a reset of the strategic workforce plan initiative. I think that's a, I think that's a, good, a good thing. But the outcome ultimately is, because one of the things I can recall, uh, I think when we actually had a fuller commission, when, when Commissioner Ostendorf was here, one of the, the concerns I know uh, Commissioner Ostendorf was somewhat dismayed about, for example, reassignment into uh, or resistant of reassignment into positions for which persons are, are qualified. Now, we're, uh, we're working on that in terms of assuring, and we should work on, on things uh, like assuring that if you're asking a person to take a task, that they're qualified to do that in and, and, and doing ways, either through the learning transformation <laughs> or other types of things. But that's why I say where, where I'm coming from is where it I think we're just at a start. Now, whether we call it Project Dame in the future or not, that, uh, to me, that, that makes uh, no difference. The, the other piece of it, I, I would say, is that there are still, there are things. We've, we've talked about, if we've made efficiencies or strove uh, toward efficiencies in things like use of resources, uh, making, uh, uh, Eric, to, Eric touched on the question of being more uh, electronic uh, in this age in terms of how we process certain things. One of the things I've heard from licensees, and actually, you know, this may be a longer term effort, uh, is, is that if you, we look at some of the uh, reporting or record keeping requirements peppered through our regulations, uh, and again, regulations uh, uh, that were promulgated when I was a boy and there weren't computers on the desk, and I will note again that the lawyers were the first ones in this agency to have computers on their desk. Um, but the, the point being that the way you, if you wanted that kind of record keeping or reporting, it had to be done, done by paper. Um, and so, and whether some of that record keeping or reporting is really necessary in this day and age. So I think those are, that's for what I'm trying to say is those are the, some of the challenges I see moving forward um, uh, in terms of taking the lessons from Project AIM applying them and, and sustaining them, because I think then we're able to focus on the things that Eric's talked about uh, with respect to if we're going to get uh, within the context, and I would expect to, in the context of 5069 and a risk-informed framework, if they, it, again, I think it helps us focus on the important regulatory issues that, that we face uh, and that we have. Let me ask a, a couple specific questions. I think, Jennifer, uh, one of the things I, I think particularly, um, and I think we've heard compliments from the agreement states with respect to the initiative to do more online learning. It costs them less, it costs us less, and you know, I, I, I think the assessment is it, it still is effective, but I, I don't know if there's particular feedback that you've had from the agreement states on that, because our ability to provide uh, the training or undergird the training is, is, is really at the, at the core of making, I think, the agreement state program successful. So if there are any, you know, any insights or, or comments yeah. you've gotten back from the, from the yeah, states. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the feedback on, from the agreement states for the um, health physics course has definitely been positive. Um, we did have the instructional staff meet with um, the students during various portions to discuss how um, it's been going. And um, I mean, overall, we've had um, positive feedback and no big issues. We did, we were able to make some minor adjustments um, based on the feedback re received, but it's been very positive from them. Okay, good. Um, I guess, uh, Eric, what, one, uh, one of the questions I would ask is in terms of, uh, um, and I, I've supported the staff's uh, initiative to 
defer or not do the business process uh, uh, initiative uh, with respect to the, the licensing. But um, what are you all thinking about within NRR um, in terms of the ability, this uh, ability or flexibility to adjust if you have, you know, the next, un, you know, unexpected type uh, uh, event that affects the affects the licensing uh, volume or the licensing flow. I think one of the things you touched on, which I think is good, is I think is an anticipation of more in the way of 5069 type requests. But yeah, that I'll start there. Of just, I mean, that's the that's the focused example. But I would say it's anticipation of increased risk and form type licensing action. So you know, with that, part of it is planning on our part. Part of that is working with industry to see if they can meter their work. Because it used to be, you know, we would just take everything in. But as we've talked about, we had people doing lower priority work. So if all of a sudden more licensing, i.e. higher priority work came in, we had that surge volume. Going back to what Commissioner Barron said, we have less and less of that surge volume. Now, we have mechanisms of contractors and whatnot. But on the 5069s, one of the things we're working with the industry right now is, is the metering, just like we do with license renewals to say, you know, here's how we can work these. Because an original estimate we got from the industry was we were going to get 22 of these in one quarter and then zero the next quarter. And we said, well, that really isn't going to work in our system. Mm -hmm. Um, the other is we're doing more cross-training, I mean, particularly across the NRR, NRO boundary. Um, with the centers of expertise we have now in some of the technical organizations, you know, they have the ability to, to do both kinds of, of work so we can look at, you know, what's higher priority. But I think it, it goes back to, I think th there's two things now. One, we're probably better planning for the fact that, okay, something is going to tip the apple cart and, you know, lessons learned from Fukushima mm -hmm. is how are we better prepared? And um, two is, you know, we're monitoring this a lot more closely now. Like I said, now with, with where we are at, any time a licensing action seems to be getting off base either on schedule or projected hours, we're doing some look-see to say what's going on here and how can we turn it around. So hopefully between better you know, planning and better real-time monitoring, we're just better equipped to deal with something like that happening in the future. Okay, thanks, I appreciate that. Scott, I wanna talk a little bit on, on the centers of expertise. Um, you talked about the tech spec and the external hazards uh, working and, and basically at this point, and, and maybe because this is as you go forward and, and uh, you know, we want to see, you know, uh, that we can achieve success in it, this, this may explain where I'm going with this question. Right now, it really focuses on NRR, NRO combination. Obviously, within the NMSS area, in both those areas, there are, con you know, there are issues of external hazards and, and NMSS uses tech specs or the, the equivalent of some of those. So, What's the thinking about where that might go in the future if, if you meet what, what I would say is our, the success metrics for it? Because I know, uh, I know some, there, there's some concern, potential concerns about what the effectiveness of that and, and that we should be on top of that and be responsive to that. So I'll right. let you. Right, so um, when we were forming the COEs, uh, it, was, it was thought about in terms of including the NMSS and the external hazard COE as well as tech specs. And it was decided that at this point in time, for external hazards, because of the way in which they work, it would be difficult for them to separate some of their project management skill sets from the folks who actually do some of the hazard work. Mm -hmm. And so they thought that it may not be the, the best time to do it. However, we have been supporting them uh, on certain discrete uh, technical areas. Okay. For example, um, for the uh, um, WCS Waste Control Specialist application, mm -hmm. we're supporting them on some of their geotechnical engineering work activities as well as their um, 
some of their siting, population density, background areas that we have expertise in that they don't have. Uh, and we also plan to su support them if they receive another application in those areas. So there's some pockets where we're, we're continuing to support them. So as that continues to work, we'll see how that develops over time to see if it makes more sense for a broader um, expansion of, of a COE into those other areas. But we are providing some support. For tech specs, it was thought of that the diversity of the types of tech specs was maybe too much to consider. Um, the tech specs branch is, is new, uh, we just formed. Um, and so we'll have to see with time whether or not that makes sense um, to, to potentially expand. But uh, right now, it was, it was thought of as too much diversity in terms of the types of tech specs. Well, I appreciate that. I think it's, a, it's wise to try to, to go, uh, you know, go smoothly but judiciously uh, into it. And I appreciate their good assessment. Last thing, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, may I give Vic an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the leadership model. Um, you know, I was one of those when it originally came to commission who did not, uh, you know, basically did not support it at that time. I recognize we allowed the opportunity and, um, I, I, I still say, you know, I still have some skepticism reading, reading the paper. Uh, that's partly my personality. Uh, I will first confess uh, uh, in terms of how I sort of look through and, 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 and structure some of those organizational things. Uh, but, you know, I respect the staff in terms of if this is something that it believes would help it. Um, but maybe I'll give you a chance, Vic, to give maybe sort of a more general defense of it, but particularly one thing I would like you to address is in these various models, and we have various things. We have principles of good regulation, organizational things, now this. We have to draw a Zen, Venn diagram, and I'm going to draw my undergraduate studies because when I was a freshman in college, I had to take philosophy and religion, and I, but I remember that. It's a famous story from the Talmud. And this Talmud is a Gentile asks, why should I convert to Judaism? And the famous answer of Rabbi Hillel, he says, why should I, con and convince me I should uh, convert when you'd explain the entire Torah to me while I stand on one foot? And the famous, the one, there's one famous rabbi who just smacks him with a cane and moves on. And the other one, Rabbi Hillel, is a very famous figure, says, um, he says, all the Torah can be reduced to one thing, do unto others as you would have them do to you. All the rest is commentary. <laughs> and in our comment, and in a way, Torah for us is the Atomic Energy Act. Perhaps we'll add the, the principles of good regulation, but it does strike me a little bit like that. We, and again, I, I, I'm respectful of the effort, but what I don't want to do is the create ever broadening circles um, and that, so I've, I've spoke, gone on, I apologize to my colleagues for going on, but I'll let you give a defense, but the one thing I would ask you to do is address uh, why to eliminate transparency, because particularly since I think that elimination could be confused. Commissioner Burns, thank you for that. I have to admit, I was initially skeptical as well. Um, I um, actually wrote the commission paper on the values um, 22 years ago, and uh, Mike Weber and I had the opportunity to sit with uh, Commissioner Rogers and explain to explain why we need these values when we have these principles that are that are the Torah, uh, and we were successful. I don't know if I'll be successful today, but I will start with uh, I understand your skepticism. What at its core persuaded me that we have an opportunity to do more um, is that we're fundamentally talking about leadership and we're all leaders uh, from wherever we are, we, we are leaders. Uh, and there's some areas that we have been able to extract from um, our Behavior Matters campaign, uh, the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey of 2015, as well as the IG Safety, Culture, and Climate Survey that point to areas where we're not doing as well as we used to. Uh, perhaps it's a temporal issue, maybe it's a demographic issue, maybe it's a leadership issue at its core, but, uh, but things are different there, and, and maybe it's environmental. Uh, I, 
but it's different and we can continue to do the same thing. We can tout our values and our principles and expect a different outcome, but um, that there is a definition for doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. Uh, so I believe we have an opportunity to do something different uh, that I believe uh, all of us can see ourselves in uh, and, and relate to, and it is those six areas. Uh, regarding the transparency characteristic, which we spoke about um, uh, as a senior leadership team quite extensively, as you know, the only value and principle that is the same is our openness value and principle. And when you read those and extrude what uh, it's at the core of it, both from an external openness perspective, from principles of good regulation and the internal openness that we derive from the uh, language and our value, it is essentially the, the, the transparency uh, theme uh, that um, that's pointed to by what we're getting out of the surveys. So, again, I, I do I do believe there's an opportunity to uh, to better connect and to uh, to operationalize those behaviors that are uh, described in those characteristics, and that's that's the opportunity that we look forward to undertaking. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'll begin by aligning myself with where Commissioner Burns opened, which is the notion about uh, closure of our AIM efforts or anything that sounds like that. It does have the uh, optic of declaring victory. I would observe that when whatever we want to term the official kickoff of Project AIM, I kind of peg it to um, a time during uh, Chairman McFarland's tenure, even though the commission and the staff had begun to engage on something that became AIM earlier than that. But AIM was launched as a five-year initiative that I think had a conclusion in 2020. So there is the perception that you would have, have, have to have, you know, well exceeded and, and had a dazzling performance beyond what you expected to declare that, you know, you're, you're closing a task early. I think of it as sustainment, and I use as an analogy what we expect of our licensees and regulated entities, which is if they've had a declining performance vector and gotten themselves in a category of greater regulatory concern and oversight, uh, we require an awful lot in terms not only of corrective actions, but then sustainment of those actions, inspection to raise our confidence of the sustainability of the corrective actions. And so I wouldn't be surprised if, if external overseers of the work of this agency expected the same of us. So I agree with Commissioner Burns that there is a substantial opportunity for assessment and then perhaps modifications or adjustments to the actions that we've taken. And in my mind, in the cycle of improvement, again, we require that of regulated entities. I think it's part of our internal culture, if we're honest about it, of continuous improvement. It's that checking and adjusting steps that go on. So uh, I think we see this in terms of the centers of expertise, where I was initially publicly skeptical, but I do want to note that the Office of EDO has a procedure now for the eventual assessment of the effectiveness of those centers of expertise. It's very systematic and rigorous, so I really look forward to what will come out of that. Uh, on the Business Process Improvement Initiative, in addition to, I think, as Commissioner Barron had talked about, NRR concluding that they had somewhat taken many of the steps of the improvement initiative in the process of addressing the backlog that had existed. I understand another justification for relooking at that particular task and undertaking a business process improvement initiative is having made those modifications to staff internal processes in order, even if you wanted to do a process improvement look right now, you have to have runtime with established procedures. I think anyone corporately would tell you that in order to come in and do an audit or assessment, I can't audit you if you just made adjustments last month and you have a completely different system for tracking yourself or doing these processes. So I get that, but on those two points, I would ask Eric, was a deferral or coming to the commission and saying, instead of not doing the business process improvement, did you think about proposing to the commission that the action be deferred for, I don't know, pick it five years or whatever? Uh, was that part of your discussion and you ended up with 
closing the activity, and if so, why? And I would ask Scott, when do you expect uh, to have initial assessments and results coming in on the effectiveness of the centers? So those two questions. I don't, whoever would like to go first, Eric, why don't you go? I'm go first. Uh, we did consider deferral, the pros and cons of deferral versus closure, and it came back to some of the things I was saying to uh, Commissioner Barron that we really, in our hearts, felt you know, that from the pure process standpoint, the BPI, even after some amount of stability, was likely not going to get many resource savings. How and, do you know that systematically, though? Is it a process that you use to arrive at the improvement initiatives you already made? Was there a systematic look? Is that how you decided upon the actions that you've already taken, which reduce the backlog? I, I think it came down to we did look at each of the piece parts of the licensing process, the acceptance review, you know, safety <laughs> evaluation development, you know, RAIs, and, and looked at— It's curious to me because the staff is very, very um, wise that if they had done that and documented it in any way, you could come to the commission and say you already did the business process improvement initiative. Was that, I guess I'm saying that I feel like if you had done a systematic look, you're likely to have documented that because that's also part of NRC culture is we're pretty thorough in documenting mm -hmm. things. And therefore, in essence, you would have done it. If it were a comprehensive look and it were documented in some ways, you would have done a business process improvement initiative. Does that make any sense? You know, no, me? I understand <laughs> where you're getting at, but it was, we were, you know, the environment we were in was we had too many old actions. So we were at the time trying to work that down. And yeah, I mean, your, your imperative was very, very clear the because the commission very, wanted very you to get rid of that backlog. Right. So there, there was a mix of dumping more resources on it to just do the work. At the same time, looking at how did we get here? How can we avoid getting here in the future? So. Well, and I'm not trying to pick on NRR, but but you know it does leave the question. It, it is reactor safety is the biggest part of our budget, which is of course if we're going to do a business process improvement anywhere, it's going to end up landing uh, a lot of it on NRR's shoulders. But I, uh, it does leave the thought that you know the conclusion that there aren't other areas that we've addressed all the areas and look at, and, and your argument might be, well, look at how we reduce the backlog in two years, and you can't argue with the results. But the point is, if you didn't take a systematic look, do you really know that you have an instinct that there aren't other things that you could harvest, other efficiencies and changes, but but how, how do you know? And we're not done. I mean, I go back to, I think, where we're at is for the process. We've looked at these administrative piece parts and 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 even with some independent reviews by different auditors, those administrative processing pieces are are pretty tight. Just from observation and also if you look at the overall contribution to the hours of a of a licensing action. Say you have a hundred hours you know, when you look at the country, there's not much benefit to be gained there. What we have left, and it goes back to um, nuclear safety, is the true, you know, development of our regulatory findings. And that's where we're saying we're not done. We realize through this technical adequacy initiative that there are still opportunities there to be gained by saying, you know, how can we ensure that you know, when, a, when an application comes in, that we're really trying to focus on what is necessary for us to make a regulatory And I, you know, I, I'm not trying to lead the witness and get an answer or help you out on marketing of your pitch to the commission, but I, and it I occurs to me that you've those. done a lot, you, you intend to continue to do a lot, you did it in a prioritized fashion of, you know, if, if a process is a 200-hour process, you spent your time on the thing that's 100 of those hours and not on the thing that's two hours of the 200 hours. So I get that, and that makes a lot of sense. But there is something kind of conclusory and a kind of like a mission accomplished about your, your coming to the commission and saying, you know, let's just not take this look. So maybe that is kind of a marketing piece. I don't know. Or maybe it's just that I'm suggesting you kind of sold yourself short in the explanation of what you've done and what you intend to do. And so I offer those cautions. But I do want Scott Flanders to be able to answer his question. <laughs> so please go ahead. So my answer hopefully will be short. Um, 
Each of the uh, COEs are required to provide their assessment within one year of the implementation date. So the first one would be in uh, this coming July in the allegations group, uh, July 2017. And then the next one would be uh, external hazards uh, in October of this year. Um, so that's the formal assessment. Of course, um, we are always seeking feedback from, from our you know, partners that we work with. Um, one of the things that we do in, uh, that we're um, planning to do as a part of our COE activities, we meet periodically with the partners. Um, we want to have a meeting where we have them all together and to discuss where we are with our priorities, uh, work activity schedules, um, also provide them an opportunity to, to talk about how things are going in terms of um, some of the rules of engagements that we spent a fair amount of time um, working on together with them and seeing if there's any things that we need to adjust as a part of that process. So we'll try to do that in advance of October, uh, and then really start really working to try to gather additional information. We actually included in the back of our um, documents when we put together the COE a um, survey that could be sent out. I was, I was checking with some of my branches. So I asked them if they actually sent the survey out. They haven't sent it out yet, but we're going to encourage them to send it out and start seeking some feedback in advance. Okay. Uh, I, and, and I mentioned this not just because it, I expressed concerns about the centers and their establishment may be obscuring two things, one of which was kind of organizational line accountability, you know, how do you get work product out of a group you don't have supervisory authority over. But also these assessments, I think, have strong tentacles into uh, kind of competency modeling, strategic workforce planning, and all of those elements coming together to get where I think Victor mentioned we, we wanted to have, you know, the right people with the right capabilities and be able to deploy them on the right work as work ebbs and flows. So I think those assessment results are important. I would just say on, uh, you know, competency modeling, really appreciate, Jennifer, your presentation and the fact that there is sensitivity that I heard throughout your presentation about the utility of the modeling and its input and its interface with individual employees. At times, the agency has heard frustrations from employees about overly elaborate systems within which they're supposed to track and report their competencies and qualifications. That's in addition to other work they're doing. So if it is overly complex and burdensome, the likelihood that they're really going to be motivated to go in there weekly and keep it up to date is less. So I, I heard in your presentation that we've heard that feedback and we're sensitive to that going forward, that this is yet another. And they also have to report time and attendance and other things because of the fee billable nature of our work. So I appreciated that as well. I'll just, uh, my last comment I think will be uh, about the leadership model. I appreciate that Commissioner Burns talked about that. I'm really trying to lay aside some of the skepticism that I feel just I'll confess the same thing he did is that this isn't my area of expertise, the whole knowledge of, of the, the community of research and practice on how do you lead and inspire and move people, how do you have accountability, I'm kind of old school, I'm like, you know, you, you have good people, you, you resource them, you equip them, you train them. You express expectations, and then you hold accountable, which is, is the really important piece there. And so when I read about leadership models, I, you know, there's a good chance more than half of it's going, going over my head because I don't, I don't really, I'm not sensitized on a lot of that. But the one obligation that I do feel in, in being a member of this commission so long is if, if the staff comes back to you a couple of times and says, we've looked at this and looked at this and we think we need this, then one obligation to me that's very, very clear is that as, as the commission, we want to be providing you with what you say you need to do to do all the hard work that, that we expect you to be doing. So I will try to keep an open mind on that. It's just, it's, it's hard to navigate through. Was there broader buy-in? Maybe you could help me here. Like, how did you, was this kind of the senior executive class who thought this? Did you do any kind of focus groups to know that kind of frontline employees also identified elements of this as something they needed? Chairman, thank you for your question. Um, the genesis was, of course, back during the uh, initial stages of, of project aim uh, in recognizing that there were uh, uh, gaps in, um, in leadership philosophy uh, that we had not 
uh, closed in spite of our values and our principles. And while there are uh, pockets um, of, um, uh, of leadership uh, and performance where these attributes, these characteristics were reflected, it's not common across uh, the agency. And even the terminology and what we mean uh, and how it manifests itself in actions and decisions and behaviors was, is inconsistent. So the question was, how do we drive alignment to gain a shared understanding of what it is we're, we're talking about? If it's not clearly in our values and principles and we've not animated it, what is it? Can we agree on the definitions? Can we agree on the, the uh, supporting, uh, again, actions and behaviors? Uh, we socialize them with the senior leadership team. We have not embedded them yet fully with either the leadership team or the staff. This would be the opportunity uh, to do that should the commission support uh, our effort to, um, to go in this direction. Well, you and I have sometimes talked about, and I've talked to other uh, senior leaders here, about first-line supervision is really one of the toughest jobs, you know, at the agency. I think as you move up in responsibility, the issues get larger. There's more issues and they're more complex. But I think in terms of managing, you know, that can be a very, very difficult job. We've, we've talked about a culture where leaders at every level and managers at every level feel, you know, a good, I'll use an Ostendorf term, forceful backup. They feel a good level of support if they approach decision making in the ways that they're expected to. They're going to get the support of the next level and the next level and the next level. Is it your sense that the leadership model you propose would support continuing to, to create that culture where, you know, branch chiefs and project managers and leaders at every level feel supported? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. And um, yes. And I, we also view a leadership model as a living document. I'm, I'm of a generation where I, I'm, I, I do it that way because that's what you told me to do. Uh, and that's what I've shown you. Uh, I believe we have a, a cross-generational demographic where more want to know not only what you want me to do, but why you want me to do it uh, and how. And that takes more time. It takes more effort. It takes more uh, uh, clear, discreet articulation of what we mean and, and consistent follow-up. Uh, and in these areas, we just have not uh, taken the opportunity to articulate that yet uh, and pull all the other pull the other pieces together so that it's harmonized. Um, other organizations have done it uh, and have created a lot of success, and that's sustainable uh, because people can see themselves in it, they can identify the gaps and be held accountable, and that accountability is another term of art that, uh, that has come up in our uh, benchmarking. And, Yet that's not clearly articulated in a principle or value, but it is part of what we do. It's part of what leaders uh, should do, even that self-management. And we, again, love the opportunity to, to build that. Okay, thank you for that. And it's clear that you bring, a, you know, a, a strong commitment to the leadership model. And so I know the commission will think about that really deeply as we uh, look at the proposal that you've laid in front of us. I reflecting a little bit longer term on Project AIM, and I, I just want to say that this, a lot about Project AIM is about, you know, the, the workforce reductions and the budget constraints and other things, but I don't, pers personally, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that there are really positive constructs around the origin of Project AIM, and I've used this kind of cheeky term of NRC 2.0 at other meetings, but I thought, you know, very sincerely for me when I tried to think and bring creative energy to Project AIM, it was about we're always improving and evolving as organizations, no matter our size, and we have an opportunity to have an invitation to bring forward, you know, if you've worked at NRC for three years or for 30 years, it's a solicitation for what kind of NRC do you want to be working at, what does it look like, and, and no one knows better the frustrations of an individual process or procedure in NRC better than NRC. I mean, we know the things that if we were king for a day, and we could rewrite these processes. So I think there's that aspect. I continue to be 
really excited about the staff's energy that they bring to this, about this initiative going forward. And, and I don't want to lose sight as we ask questions and have this dialogue of those aspects about NRC's future, which I think are so exciting at bottom. And so I had a, a weird idea that I was going to ask Victor for my Q&A, and I'm way over time, but I was going to ask you to either think about or respond to the question, says, at the next Project A meeting, or if it's a year from now and you're sitting across from the commission and whatever people are here on the commission at that time, and it's the Project A meeting, you know, what do, if you've been successful as the EDO in marshalling everything and, and having success on all these initiatives, what are the kinds of things that you're presenting to the commission at that time? What kind of successes? What are the topics? And what are you saying? You don't have to give the answer, because it's the kind of thing I should have told you in advance if I was really going to ask you. But I, I, I think it's a great question. I, I, would, I would start by saying um, I, I, would, um, I would have hoped before coming to this meeting that it wouldn't have been a Project AIM meeting, uh, but it would have been an efficiency, effectiveness, and agility meeting which I believe is the core of AIM. It was the core that we spoke about in a senior leadership meeting in November 2013. We conducted a, a SWOT analysis and said, you know, we need to do differently. We need to do more effective, more efficient, and more agile. I believe when we get there as an organization and have confidence that we're, we're doing that routinely uh, without a project label, that would be, that would be the, the major success. Uh, I believe we would have delivered on a leadership model and we would have integrated it in a way that uh, everyone can see themselves uh, in. I believe we would have sustained the uh, business process improvements we've seen in NRR and all of the metrics, including the three additional ones that NRR created that Eric spoke to. We'd be achieving on those in the context of the enterprise risk management, which we didn't have an opportunity to speak to, but we would have operationalized that uh, within our culture, so we're anticipating uh, work and, um, and and risks and mitigating them, and that'll be folded into a enhanced strategic workforce planning uh, framework where we'll be able to uh, to identify the resources that that we need that we may not have in our initiating steps uh, to bring them on board and get them fully a train and train and acculturated. Most importantly, uh, we will have be still fulfilling our safety and security mission because without that. Uh, all of these other great things, which are enablers, uh, are, are less important. Thank you for that. I want to ask my colleagues if they had any additional questions. Uh, just a couple sure. of questions to follow up the leadership model. I feel badly doing it because that was just such a nice close. But um, uh, <laughs> so one of the one of the things that the paper contemplates is uh, the establishment of a working group to develop the leadership model. Could you just briefly talk, Vic, about? kind of the level of effort you're envisioning for this process. The, with the characteristics, um, the leadership characteristics already drafted by the, by the leadership team that was involved in this and presented in the paper, what do you see as the, what, what the working group would be doing? All right, thank you for that question. I, I see those, the characteristics and the definitions um, it, describing the, the what um, those characteristics look like. It doesn't have uh, and doesn't describe the, the how uh, those uh, specific behaviors we would expect from one another as we demonstrate uh, those characteristics. Uh, it doesn't provide the, the measurables, how we're going to incorporate them uh, in our routine processes to make sure that they're, uh, that they're understood and they're being uh, Im embedded. And again, the, the connection with uh, our values and, and our principles, that, that work uh, would be what the focus of the working group uh, would, um, that, that's principally what the working group would, would focus on. And, and just in terms of the, the timing of this, obviously there's a lot of change going on right now. I think everyone knows that and feels that. Talk for a minute about whether this is the right time for this. I don't want folks to be overwhelmed with just another initiative when they're also trying to do their work. Is this the right time for this? Is a year from now the right time for this? Can you give and, and I think that? that's a great question as well. As you know, there are a number of activities on, underway, and the staff has great capacity to, uh, to carry out uh, those that are ongoing, including the Strategic Workforce Planning Initiative. Um, we're moving forward with an implementation plan for the recent uh, mission uh, support tasking. Um, 
of course, I'm optimistic uh, about um, where we'll be on the leadership model, but I believe that the time scale, if you would, for implementing that is something that we can implement later uh, after completion of, of those first two uh, deliverables, which I would expect this spring. So I, I believe we have the capacity to begin this uh, early to midsummer um, and, uh, and produce the results before the end of the year. So. Uh, I do believe we have the capacity to get this done. I'd also mention that the recent um, projects of the SES Canada Development Program were, are in line uh, with a number of the characteristics that have been identified here. So a, a lot of the legwork has, has already uh, been done. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Well, um, with that, I thank the staff for their presentation, and I now invite Maria Schwartz, Vice President of the National Treasury Employees Union, for her remarks on behalf of NTEU. Good morning, Chairman Savinicki, uh, Commissioners Edia McCree, NRC executives and managers and fellow bargaining unit employees. It's a pleasure to be able to be here um, to address you on behalf of NTEU in this forum. NTEU, as we always stress at these meetings, is the exclusive representative of our bargaining unit employees here at the NRC. And I'm joined this morning, I think we have a bridge line by um, our chapter president, Cheryl Burroughs, and here there are some of our officers and stewards. First of all, on behalf of NTEU, I want to congratulate Chairman Savinicki on her appointment. Um, T NTEU wishes you well as the agency enters 2017 with the many challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Uh, turning to today's commission briefing on Project AIM, I will begin with basic planning concepts that we've all heard of from our earliest school years. Who, what, when, where, how, and why. As union leaders, we are most interested in how decisions affect employees in the execution of their work. The what, the when, the where, and the why must be accepted and are not in question. The mission of the NRC defines these questions. However, the who and the how speak to where there is opportunity to work together. Thus, my remarks this morning will be framed by the who and the how of our work. The who, who performs the work, who manages the work, and who makes the decisions. The how, how the work is done, including a consideration of the processes and procedures that are in place to support the performance and execution of the work. How is training handled to ensure that it is aligned with processes and competencies? And how does training promote employee professional growth? Along with Cheryl Burroughs, chapter president, I have spoken here since the beginning of the Project AIM initiative on behalf of our bargaining unit employees, advocating the clarity of roles and responsibility, advocating the clarity of expectations, advocating for aligning um, our training, and advocating for fairness. Steadily, daily, employees talk with us and other union representatives about their concerns about work expectations that are not clear, about managers who are, not cons or who are inconsistent in their directions, about training that is not provided, or rotational details or opportunities in spite of developing as suggested in IDP that are not available. It is with these conversations in mind that I reflect on the comments provided today and the reports on the progress of Project AIM. Our agency leadership launched Project AIM in 2014 in response to a changing external environment, a nuclear renaissance that did not come to fruition, resulting in a reduction in work, and a Congress grown skeptical about the NRC budget. To address this, the agency developed Project AIM an initiative containing 19 discrete tasks whose primary objective was to proactively ensure that as the agency downsized in response to a reduced workload, the NRC would continue to effectively accomplish its health and safety mission. Over the last year, Project AIM status has been reduced from an initiative to a project with its completion fast approach and approaching as reflected in today's briefing, as well as of the January 2017 progress report that asserts that almost all of the 19 discrete tasks associated with Project AIM have in fact been completed. Of particular interest in looking at the who and the how is that the January update st um, states that the strategic workforce um, plan is complete. The, uh, NTEU is concerned about this assertion, and it seems that uh, Commissioner um, uh, Burns and Chairman Savinicki are as well uh, concerned about calling things completed that shouldn't be. 
Um, in June 2015, the commission tasked the staff to, quote, develop a strategic workforce plan that ensures the NRC is positioned to have the right number of people with the right competencies at the right time, end quote. Many NRC employees that NTEU has spoken with, including some upper level managers, believe that the agency should have had a robust strategic workforce plan in place before the, pro the agency even began Project AIM. Acknowledging that the agency did not, there were many, including the commission, who believed that the development of a strategic workforce plan was critical to the agency's success as Project AIM proceeded. A year later, when it appeared that the agency still had not developed a strategic workforce plan, the commission inquired about this. At the commission briefing on Project AIM in March 2016, <clears throat> Commissioner Barron asked a very simple question, quote, and where are you right now on the status of the streamlined strategic workforce planning tool? Is that something we, um, is it ready to go, end quote? The response was, quote, we don't actually have that right now. What we have is we have tribal knowledge about, you know, where people know that there's vacancies in the organization and where people have skill sets to match it, end quote. To be fair, it is important to note that finally in January of this year, the EDO established a working group directed to enhance strategic workforce planning. However, recall that the January status for Project AIM in indicates the, strate the strategic workforce plan has been complete for quite a while. As an aside, the recently published COMSECI 170006, which you've talked about, the regulatory um, commission's leadership model, states, quote, upon commission approval, the staff will begin drafting a written statement regarding the desired leadership beliefs and fundamental behaviors that support the noted characteristics. Although constructing the leadership model is an important first step to realizing a comprehensive set of behavioral expectations, these behaviors will enable NRC to become an even stronger regulator as we operate in an environment of increasing change and complexity, end quote. Well, this begs the question, what leadership model are we operating under now? This leadership question highlights the frustration employees have experienced throughout Project AIM, which includes the length of time it has taken the agency to undertake the development of a strategic workforce plan. Our employees expressed desire for transparency and their ongoing willingness to trust leadership is simply lost through NRC executive statements like, we haven't developed a strategic workforce plan because we are too busy saving jobs right now. NTEU sees this as the most, in the most recent OIG safety culture and climate survey, which reports that employees, quote, do not have confidence in senior management and feel senior management does not provide a clear sense of direction, end quote. At this point, is it enough to say better late than never regarding the creation of a strategic workforce working group? While NTE will most certainly work with the agency going forward, is it reasonable to ask NTEU, as we were asked last week by a senior executive, to suspend judgment on what has already occurred and only focus on what the agency is planning to do going forward? And to put that request in context, NTEU officials have spent much of their time in recent weeks attending meetings that address the potential for a RIF, how to avoid a RIF, how to communicate to our employees and our supervisors the potential for a RIF. And of course, NTEU officials and stewards have also spent a great deal of time, a great deal of that time speaking directly with concerned employees who own houses and support families to provide as much information as we can so that our employees can better deal with the uncertainties of the current agency environment. So what are the consequences of not having a strategic workforce plan at this point beyond the obvious? Until the recently issued memorandum enhancing strategic workforce planning, the agency has been re relying on a group of deputy office directors to determine and report their office's staffing needs and overages. These needs and overages, finally defined over about the last year, have apparently been developed by methods that have been described, as we just heard, by, as tribal uh, knowledge and word of mouth. So many of our employees see the ability to advance their careers. You're wondering about where they're going to go and what they're, how, if they're going to stay, because they see this as, as subjective and unfair, since two of the very few ways to do this now are solicitations of interest and lateral moves, which are currently driven by tribal knowledge and are not subject to the merit selection procedures. NTEU is concerned that because SOIs and lateral moves are not governed by merit selection procedures, that they are ripe for abuse and in some cases, in fact, are being abused. 
NTEU believes that developing internal procedures that address this should be part of, a strategically, of strategically developing the workforce. Additionally, such procedures would create a more transparent and fair approach for those employees that remain after attrition, buyout, early outs, and potentially a RIF. The current assurances that our leadership are providing to our employees about their professional growth don't correspond with what our employees are telling NTEU. The current state of employee growth, an issue which should be considered as part of a strategic workforce plan, has damaged morale horribly. Likewise, trust, so easy to lose and so hard to build, and yet so necessary to an engaged workforce, is at an all-time low as confirmed by the 2016 OIG Safety, Culture, and Climate Survey and the Federal Employees Viewpoint Survey results. NTEU is aware that plans and intentions can be overtaken by circumstances beyond the agency's control. However, when this happens, NRC, le NRC leadership should be more concerned than ever that communications are honest and transparent. And if recent communications aren't working, it is critically important that agency leaders find ways to communicate that are effective. A strategic workforce plan is critical if NRC hopes to rebuild trust, re-engage, and re-energize an amazing workforce that seeks clarity regarding workload projections and their ability to develop and grow professionally. The NRC's organizational structures, processes, procedures, and other internal controls cited in the Strategic Workforce Working Group document must not only support the accomplishment of the NRC's mission in an effective, efficient, and agile manner, but these same structures, processes, procedures, and internal controls found in a strategic workforce plan must support the growth of our employees, our agency's most important resource. During times of change, it is more important than ever to adhere to our agency's core values, integrity, service, openness, commitment, cooperation, excellence, and respect. NTEU sees great symbolism that the first of the NRC values is integrity and that respect completes the enumeration of these values. NTEU recognizes that work has been done and we do not want to negate the importance of that work, but we ask you, our commissioners, to recognize also that while you have been briefed on the successes and the completion of project aim tasks, that you also recognize there is another side to the story, the side that I have attempted to describe to you in these comments. NTEU stands ready to help as it has over the last several years, but such help and cannot and never will include being silent, nor does NTEU's continued support include the affirmation of metrics that indicate an activity is complete when all evidence shows that the activity is still a work in process, nor does that support include the affirmation of information that does not address essential considerations of the who and the how of the work that is expected of our dedicated bargaining unit employees. Our bargaining unit employees continue to act with integrity and dedication. From their leadership, our bargaining unit employees deserve accountability, honesty, transparency, and respect. Thank you for this opportunity to provide our comments. Thank you, Maria. And again, I thank all of the participants for the perspective and the dialogue that we've had here today. With that, we are adjourned.